Hello, and welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast, where it is my job to discuss democratic institutions. Kenya's 2010 constitution brought about substantial changes to the vertical allocation of political power that has been exercised at two tiers of government since then, the central government and the 47 counties. Despite the devolution of Kenya's government functions, the country is organized as a unitary state, and hence county governments are not as independent as in a truly federal structure. Yet, Devolution is giving the subnational governments significant political decision-making power by defining the functions that the lower tiers of government can exercise. With Brenda Ogembo, I discuss the many different facets of Kenya's devolution since 2010. She explains the historic background of the struggle for political power between the center and the various regions and tribes of Kenya. Brenda is convinced that the Kenyan people are generally satisfied with having more political responsibilities and power at the county level, while the implementation is of course challenging. I also ask her about the effects of the plurality electoral system on the composition of county assemblies and the role of international development partners that play a central part in guiding citizen participation through citizen assemblies, but also have made themselves hard to replace. We really do tap into a great variety of topics around devolution in Kenya. I'm very happy to welcome her as guest on the Rules of the Game podcast. Brenda Ogembo is a democracy and governance expert and works as a principal clerk assistant for the Senate Legislative and Procedural Services at the Parliament of Kenya. She holds a PhD in political science and governance from the University of Birmingham. What makes this conversation so fascinating is that Brenda not only has done extensive research on Kenya's devolution, but that she also has many years of experience working for the parliament in Kenya, implementing such processes and thus providing first-hand experiences. I am your host, Stefan Kibwurz, and this is the 19th episode of the Rules of the Game podcast. I am a political economist with a PhD in economics from the University of Bern in Switzerland and I previously held positions at the London School of Economics and Political Science and the Center for Global Development. You find a full transcript of the conversation on my website rulesofthegame.blog. If you like this episode, please leave a review on your preferred platform and share it with friends and colleagues. Now, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Brenda Ogembo. Brenda Ogembo, welcome to the Rules of the Game podcast. I'm very happy to have you on the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. So as usual, I uh, ask the first question to all my guests. Uh, what is your first memory of democracy or maybe of politics in general? That was an interesting question, actually, when I saw it, because I really had to think back to my first memory of democracy. And um, it, I think actually I realized it was what we call in Kenya the Saba Saba riots, which happened, which took place in 1990. And that was on July 7th. And so seven is Saba in Kiswahili, and that's why they're called Saba Saba riots. And at the time, it was organized by civil society activists who were campaigning for a return to multipartism and a change in the constitution in Kenya at the time. And the reason why this stands out to me is because it was a first time, I think, I actually realized, about four and a half years old, I realized that we lived under a dictatorship and this wasn't okay. Uh, at the time, I don't think, you know, the age of four and a half, you really thought about the system of government that you live under. But I remember that we had to stay home because there was so much violence um, that took place. Um, and we were not able to go to school, if I'm not mistaken, for about a day or two days. Um, and I really began to realize that there is something 
about who governs you. And I'd hear my parents talking and I'd pay more attention to some of the fears they had about, for example, um, you know, threats to people's lives, people who had been killed or assassinated or I guess a suspected assassinations that have never been proven and the grievances that um, arose from you know, kind of ethnic conflict between um, communities. So I think that was a time when I really began to realize that there is democracy, there is a difference between types of government, there's places where people have greater choice in the kind of governments they have, how much they can speak out. But I think it was mainly the realization that my parents lived in so much fear. There was so much fear. And you, even in school after it happened, you know, our parents would tell us, don't talk about it, don't ask questions um, about, you know, political leaders, don't talk about so-and-so. And so we began to really, I think that's when it really began to hit me that there is something different um, about the country that I live in. Because because you would hear parents talking about wanting to relocate, leave the country, live in you know more democratic countries. Obviously, some of this made more sense the older I got, but that really is my past memory of democracy. Mm, thank you for sharing that. That's very impressive, and I guess it also made a huge influence on your your life in the sense you know what what career you have chosen. So you were working in for Parliament in Kenya. And also you have done a lot of research uh, about local democratic participation at the county level. So what, what motivated you to, to do this uh, research and how was it related to your work? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think one, there, there are two parts to this question. So there's a question about why I studied democratic participation, but there's a question about why the interest kind of in democracy more broadly. And that, as you say, is partly history, but also as I, and the experience with obviously um, living under a dictatorship for so many years, or autocratic government, if you will, for so many years. But then as I got older and, you know, had my degree and now, you know, were adults who could vote, seeing so many people in my generation who had kind of grown up towards in the 90s, when we're much younger and we could not vote, but had lived under this move to move to multipartism, move to, you know, the right to be able to um, have free and transparent elections, really lived through um, this push towards more transparent and accountable government, begin to ask for a return to more autocratic government. Um, because, you know, this idea of benevolent dictatorship, that, you know, Africa cannot work unless you have a benevolent dictatorship, um, seeing People, you know, my generation who their parents had fought so much for the right to be able to vote in multi-party elections, choose not to vote because they felt that, you know, it made no difference um, to the outcome of the election. The elections would be rigged. And so I think it was a question, especially because... I mean, I think I don't believe in benevolent dictatorship because it relies on the principle that you're going to have a benevolent dictator. But so many people felt that way. Um, and so the interest in being able to study democracy began there. Why do people feel this way? What is wrong? Why isn't democracy working in African countries the way that it's supposed to work? Why are people so frustrated? Uh, of course, I know that there's a big slide um, away from this and more into populism right now. But still, it's been there for a while, especially for my generation. Uh, and so one of the things that led me to studying democratic participation um, more specifically, or for being able to engage in decision making in government, was the re was the fact that the Kenyan constitution, the 2010, when we changed our constitution in 2010, one of the main pillars was to give people a voice, to be able to determine the decisions of government and to be right at the center of it. In fact, that really, especially after years of advocating, that is one of the most central themes in the current constitution of Kenya, where literally government cannot make any decision without the input of people. Um, and they must have a say, they must be involved um, in any kind of decision. For example, we have participation on every single legislation that goes through you know our local um, legislatures at the county level and at the national level but despite this despite this thing that they had fought for for so long there was so much apathy when it was finally instituted people would not show up they were discouraged they felt like it was performative and having worked in parliament at the time i saw this performance and i saw the frustration between the elected members and the public that this thing that everybody had fought for for so long was not working um, the way it should. And so it was a question of why isn't it working? Why is this uh, something that people wanted so much? It now seems like something that's being forced down the throats of both elected members and the public. 
And is it having any impact? Was it the right approach? Was it the right thing that we should have done? Should we really be doing public participation? Do citizens have the right understanding? Do they have the capability to actually participate? Is this more about citizens kind of, you know, being apathetic, not wanting to be engaged, but really wanting transparent and open government, but not wanting to have to play a role to achieve that? Um, so yeah, the the work of Caroline Hendricks comes to mind when it comes to this kind of issues about you know citizens really do not want to be called upon to have to engage um, and make decisions, or rather that the right decisions are made for them. So that really is where my interest in understanding public participation, because I worked in Parliament of the State and I worked in committees, um, and I saw this every single day in my work. I had to put bills out for public participation, and I was literally on the phone calling people to show up for meetings. And then I began to see a gatekeeping process evolving where it was always the same people. And so there was nothing different, really, um, in what was happening now and you know before the new constitution and so I decided to go and do my PhD and focus a bit more um, on trying to understand how people interpret um, public you know deliberation and public participation as it's called in Kenya. Yeah. So we already mentioned uh, the constitution of uh, 2010. Can you walk us through what are like the main milestones in terms of devolution of, of power and political decision making, because the constitution really created a new level of government, the, the counties. There are 47 counties and each county has a government and specific um, responsibilities and functions, which sometimes are shared with the central government. But from your perspective, what are really the key elements that that uh, were part of the devolution of of political decision making in in Kenya. Um, I think it's important to start slightly further back because um, the constitution of Kenya created obviously two levels of government, but this wasn't the first time that Kenya had had this. Um, in 1963, the 1963 independence constitu constitution actually had two level of two levels of government. So you had the national government, and then you had regional governments. Only that there were seven at the time. Um, and if you look at the regional governments that were there at the time, they're pretty much arranged by. Um, tribal communities, if you will, um, you can actually see the tribal arrangements uh, that exist at the time. So this was in 1963. Um, but the two major, so we had two parties at independence and the main party or the, the leading uh, party was in, in power at the time, but leading up to the uh, independence and, you know, the establishment of the constitution, the main party, which was Kanu, was made up of the two biggest communities in Kenya, if you will. And they were very interested in centralized government. The smaller communities were very afraid that their issues would be absorbed. And so they were really advocating for regional government. And so obviously the independence constitution, in order to, I mean, it gave Kanu power, and Kanu went into, you know, was the uh, party in government, and Kadu agreed to partner, but that was based on the fact that we would have regional governments. And so they would have a bit of say about what was happening and the smaller communities would not get absorbed, and they had regional assemblies. Um, but this was never, it was never in the interest of the ruling party and the two major, the two big communities and they wanted centralized government and so in 1966 because obviously you know there were changes constitution already happening um our independent president was already beginning to show autocratic tendencies and so in 1966 they made an amendment to the constitution that abolished regional governments and with it they abolished the senate which i work in now and you created a unicameral parliament and you know we had centralized government and even though they did away with this regional government um, and the Senate, the issues and the reasons for the establishment of regional governments never went away because obviously Kenya has deep, if you know about Kenyan politics, it has very deep ethnic cleavages. It's a big part of our politics. Um, and so that never went away. The smaller communities feeling that they had been um, subsumed, the fact that um, obviously as we progressed under that constitution, political power became very much about the tribe that was in power and not really two tribes. Um, and so the two tribes that had even formed government at independence fell out. And so there was deep marginalization of regions in the country. 
And so the discourse was always on the table about returning to um, regional government or to devolved government, where people would be able to make decisions about their livelihoods and you know, be able to address issues of marginalization because all decisions were being taken at the center. And this never went away. In fact, um, the discussion was only uh, suppressed because of you know stronger and stronger autocratic governments. In 2003, obviously, Kenya then goes through a period in the leading from the 80s to the 90s where you have multipartism come back, um, and then you have the general election take place where you know President Moi, the second president, then retires in 2002 and the opposition takes over. Um, and so, under President Kibaki in 2003, you have the introduction of the Constituencies Development Fund, um, you know, which, for example, is similar to the ones that were first introduced in India. And this was not really about regions per se, but it was about independent individual constituencies getting a percentage of ordinary revenue to be able to determine their own development programs. And there was a criteria of the kind of programs that would be done, but was really supposed to address deep issues of marginalization that had come through the years of, you know, over 20 years of the Moi government. Um, and it was for building things like classrooms, you know, doing small roads, uh, building markets. It was really left up to constituencies to determine what they wanted, um, if you will. And so the member of parliament would appoint a board that would then consult the community, if you will, about what, what they wanted done. And they, you know, they would then get the revenue from, you know, the constituency development fund board would be distributed to them and they were free to do this project. So it would be oversight, but it was their project. So they determined the development projects that they wanted. And this was very popular. It was extremely popular and probably one of, and it was very successful, especially for areas that had been extremely marginalized uh, under the under the Moi government. Um, and so when it came time to agitate, when the agitation for a new constitution, because Kibaki had promised a new constitution, when that agitation grew, there was no way that devolution was not going to be on the table. Everybody wanted funds devolved because they had seen the power of people having say of a decision making or policy making within, you know, their own um local, if you wish, or within their own county, whatever it was going to be. They wanted decision making power brought down to a lower level, especially on service delivery. Um, and so that is where I think CDF cemented the fact that if there was going to be any change to the constitution, um, it was definitely going to have to include regional government. Um, and the, what the counties or whatever it is at the time it was in counties, whatever regional level of government was created, was going to have to have a percentage of the national revenue to to be able to um, determine for both at a local level what it is that they wanted their priorities to be, um, and ensure that there was even dis- um, you know even development, if you will, that marginalized areas where nobody would ever have to rely on centralized government to deliver services to them. And so then you have the activism around the 2010 constitution. There were many permutations proposed. I think at one point we had a hundred and something counties on some of the drafts. Oh, wow. At some point we had eight um, going back to, they added one because we had, um, if I'm not wrong, eight provinces um, before the new constitution. There are people who felt that we should have the devolved units operate around those eight um, uh, provinces. In the end, they settled for 47, which was the old district. Um, I believe, in the constitution, the independence constitution, or the governing districts before independence, I, I forget. But they settled on the old districts and they agreed on 47 counties, um, which once again were you know, small enough uh, to allow for communities to feel that they were you know, able to make decisions about their own lives. But really, it was about the fact that at this point, everybody was so worried about being marginalized that it was ensuring beyond like tribes, smaller tribes would have say in government, they would have their own governments, but also balancing um, almost clan, you know, clan, because we have, even though in Kenya you have ethnic tribes, some of those tribes as they exist, are a creation of um, colonial administration requirements. And so you have, for example, lawyers, but there are very many different sub-tribes within that. And so the 47 uh, counties sort of respond to that. And it was largely, it was the most acceptable um, alignment that was created um, for devolution. Mm -hmm. And may I quickly ask, um, like the pressure for the changes in the 2010 uh, constitution, the, the devolution of power, did that more come from from the population or was it more the political uh, 
elite that decided it was necessary to to devolve power in order to safeguard you know the the functioning of the of the country to understand the Chantel constitution initially it was what you would now call the current political elite. But at that time, they were all in civil society because a lot of the current people in government at the time, the push for the Chittenden Constitution had begun before 2003, when Moi was still in power. And all these people were in the opposition. They were all either active in civil society, many of them were active in civil society and had been lobbying for this for very many years. Yeah. And so in 2003, when Kibaki was elected, one of his promises was that he would deliver a constitution um, and he would respond to some of the needs that people had. Devolution was a promise at the time. And there are many things, you know, the independent judiciary. Um, what else? So there were a number of things that people really wanted um, the, the new constitution to respond to protection of political parties and things like that. And now, in 2003, when Kibaki was elected, obviously he came into power with the old constitution that created a very strong centralized presidency. Um, and he was in power with many, it was a coalition government with many um, people in power of different ethnic communities. And so it was easy for him um, at the time um, to be able to push aside, if you will, the push for a new constitution. So that's why in 2003, you don't see a new constitution. And then you come and we get to the election in 2007, where he's now fallen out with the main leader um, who he had signed you know, the coalition ag- agreement with, Ray Odinga. And so at this point, you have a huge fight um, where they demand, actually, that actually had a referendum at some point where Kibaki tried pushing, I think it was in 2005, Kibaki tried pushing a constitution, because he had promised to deliver it. He brought a constitution that was roundly rejected, did not propose, did not go as far as people wanted on issues of devolution, was still quite centralized. And so that his, Kibaki's proposed constitution fails. And so Raila Odinga then leaves government at this point and pretty much joins you know, the opposition and is preparing for the 2007 election. And so you have many political elites at this point then leave, who are in government, leave to join the and opposition. Civil society is still advocating because there's been a complete failure of this proposed constitution in 2005. And so when you have the election in 2007, Kenya is extremely divided. And, you know, people at this point felt that Raila is the one who's going to deliver the 2007 election. But then you have the deep violence that then takes place in 2007 aid for the election, that election that leads to so much um, ethnic violence when people feel that Traela has been denied the presidency and the Kibaki presidency has stolen it. And I think that moment was a moment of reflection for all the political elites. I think they realized that they needed to devolve power, they needed to deliver a constitution for the Kenyan people, that they could not go to another election with this constitution. Um, And so your question is twofold. I think the people began it, but I think the delivery was about consensus among political elites. Um, I, I don't think that just the push, it had been there for a long time, but I think if Kibaki and Raila had not had the big fallout that they did, it might have you know, been pushed down the line, there would have been continued debate, should we do this? No, let's you know, constantly draft after draft. But 2007, 2008, one of the agreements even towards peace was that there would be a constitution. This would not be put off. It would have to be passed. In fact, initially, I'd say 100 days. He did that was 2005. But I think the coalition agreement then set up farm timelines and put external actors who would oversee the delivery of the new constitution. And it happened because there was a consensus among political elites who knew that they needed a new constitution to be able to keep um, the state together. And then we have the 2010 constitution being delivered, um, you know, two years or a year and a half after that election, if you will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's that's very interesting. These these developments um, and also the the struggle or the you know the push of civil society of the population putting pressure on on the elite really, and they realizing that there is no other way than going forward with a with a new constitution. And yeah. I think we see this pattern often uh, in you know in, in many countries actually when new constitutions um, come into come into place. Now, going back to my um, previous question, like the kind of milestones or how how did Kenya essentially then devolve power? What what were the main main elements? So Kenya's constitution, um, 
is what I think is called by devolution, you know, academics, big bang devolution. So Kenya, you know, passed the 2010 constitution um, and we're going to elections in 2013 and we pretty much essentially just evolved everything at once. Um, obviously, there was supposed to be phase devolution. That was what was supposed to have been done. Um, they set up what was called the transition authority, uh, which was supposed to was set up before 2013. And the transition authority was supposed to study sort of all government ministries and determine based on what was in the 2010 constitution lists what functions belong to national government and which ones belong to county governments. So national government obviously remains with big functions such as security, um, education, except um, early childhood education, defense issues, um, certain no, agriculture is fully devolved. There are a few others. If you look at the Trinitarian Constitution, it lists, I think, about 20 functions, but it also lists about 20 functions for the county government, um, such as early child education, agriculture, health, up to um, the what we call level five. So the national government deals with national hospitals, whereas county governments deal with all other hospitals uh, below that. Gambling, for example, betting halls, um, those kind of things, sanitation, um, you know, local community service issues. And so the transition authority was then supposed to study and help ministries unbundle these functions and determine what would remain at national government and what would go to county government and also do a costing of these functions, which has never been done. But we're supposed to do a costing of these functions that would then also help determine how much it would cost for counties to deliver these services. Um, obviously, National government was not willing to let go of, you know, as happens everywhere, did not want to let go of a lot of the services it had. For example, in healthcare, for example, I mean, it had all been taken away and given to county governments, effectively leaving a ministry with only policy um, in the national hospital. And yet health is a budget that has a lot of money. So you, you, you obviously have resistance from some of those ministries. But the agreement was that the transition authority would enable a phased transaction because if the staff who work in the ministries are also supposed to be transferred to county governance. When you have the governors come in in 2012, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, 2012-13, they demand, especially on the roads function, they demand that all services be devolved immediately. They wanted every service that had been given to them, every authority that had been given to them the constitution, they wanted it, they wanted the money that went with it. They did not want to work on a phased um, transition. And the reason why this works, obviously, is because the governors that are then in power at the time were former members of parliament. So they were kind of the senior political elite who then moved to the counties to become governors. Uh, you know, in, they immediately saw that this is where the money was going to be. And these political elite are also funders of political party, they're the decision makers in the political party. Um, <clears throat> and so when they demanded that, you know, the powers be devolved to them, it was very hard for the president to say no. And they had a lot of push, mm -hmm. they had a lot of persuasion. And so Kenya goes into this big bank devolution where all the services are literally transferred and you have a huge mess that occurs that I think in certain aspects is still being resolved. Obviously, there's been a lot of development, uh, partner support to be able to try and resolve that. Um, but in certain sectors, you know, you have staff staying with a ministry who are supposed to go to county level who really resisted because they did not want to go to county governments to work there. Um, you have counties that did not want staff from the ministries who wanted to hire their own personnel because you have people who have been campaigning for you, who are setting up administrations from scratch, so they want their own uh, people to work in those counties. And then, of course, there was not clarity. I think the biggest concern beyond the political was the financing of services, which wasn't clear because when national government and all functions were centralized, national government has space or has the authority to move funding around, you know, so long as it's within the budget ceiling, it will move funds around the central issue and do this, but it does. To able to fund different sectors. And some of it was even funded with development partner support that does budget support, especially, for example, like in healthcare. And so when they transfer functions to counties, national government holds on to quite a bit of the funding. Uh, for example, healthcare is one of the biggest examples where it holds on to the funding and also development partners don't want to send money down to the counties. And so the service goes 
but then the fans don't follow the functions. Um, and so you have a situation where counties are unable to deliver services at the level that they're supposed to because there's insufficient funding for functions. Um, and this has remained a huge situation, including the fact that costing of functions was never completed. And so even the cost of delivering functions and how, remember, national government was marginalizing many counties. Now that you divide the money across the counties, it's still not enough because the basis for sharing revenue and the Commission of Revenue Allocation that is supposed to guide this process that was established for the 2010 Constitution is now trying to rectify this by trying to kind of find out what does it actually cost to deliver functions in some of the more rural areas or kind of some of the far-flung areas compared to a city like Nairobi, what is actually the actual and correct basis for sharing revenue between the counties. Um, and so that has continued to be an issue. So once you have this big bang devolution then taking place where funds at, uh, functions are sent to counties, um, they find that there's not enough funding, the, there's a big push then, obviously, for counties to raise their own revenues. Um, which yeah. really was not anticipated. I mean, I know people may hold a different position from me. People say that counties should be able to raise funds, they have the opportunities to be creative and develop revenue raising measures. The constitution doesn't really, doesn't give many opportunities to Kenyan's county governments to raise revenues. They can raise some fees, um, like for market licenses. Uh, one question I had was, so the, the constitution didn't even allow the counties to raise more. I mean, they were these specific types of taxes or, or fees that they can collect, but the county governments weren't uh, allowed to to create new ways of uh, raising money? Or maybe that's what you wanted to, to, to explain? Yeah, that's what I wanted to explain. So there were, they had very few, it, there was fees, and if I'm not mistaken, property taxes. But the pro property taxes that you can collect primarily would be in cities, would be Nairobi and Mombasa. Remember that most of Kenya is still if you will, has agricultural land. Most of it is freehold, it's rural land, um, and people do not pay property taxes on it. They probably pay, they primarily pay in cities, in urban areas. Um, and we don't have many classified urban areas. So we have an Urban Areas and Cities Act um, that was supposed to have been passed under the new constitution to kind of reclassify and agree what constitutes an urban area. This was also very controversial because a lot of the, counties are in rural areas and trying to make people who are holding family land pay property taxes is extremely complicated. Um, and in some of the areas, it's community land held in community trust. And so the property table, if you wish, if you will, in Kenya is not that large and it's an extremely political issue. Um, even in Nairobi, being the, you know, the county government is probably one of the highest um, own source revenue collectors, there are still huge issues with collecting or raising property taxes. And this is an even bigger issue in more rural counties, which a larger percentage, a greater percentage of Kenya's county governments are. And so this is not a main revenue honor for Kenya's county governments. Um, many of them have tried to introduce fees, building markets, um, getting traders to pay fees. One of the biggest that became very controversial and has ended up in court. And I was going to say that many, the kind of the jurisprudence around devolution issues that have been litigated is also kind of setting up the structure of Kenya's um, devolution. So county governments tried to raise revenues by taxing companies that were working in their counties um, as kind of sets where they would pay to be able to cross or take, you know, rope materials out of their counties um, for f refinement in Nairobi or in the capital in another town. And obviously, manufacturers, um, companies were able to come together and lobby uh, the Senate. And eventually this went to court, it was declared illegal, they don't have the jurisdiction to do it. So it has never really taken off. Um, and this is because of the desperation that arises from counties needing money to also, they're underfunded, but they also need money to de deliver the development needs that people want. So, for example, County governments, Kenya is primarily, um, you know, it's still a council, middle income country, but you have a lot of poor people who need, who rely heavily on government um, services, if you will. And so when they see, when local government was brought to them, there's not a very clear, they don't separate, and this is one of the issues that comes up in participation, they don't separate who is 
delivering what? They don't understand that this is a role of national government, this is a role of county government. When they go to their county, they want education. You know, they want to know why teachers are not showing up. They want to be able to go to a fire hospital and they want the county to pay for them. They want the county to build more hospitals or, you know, employ more teachers or, you know, they don't really separate. National government has this jurisdiction and we need to lobby them for this or county government has this, you know, specific roles and we need to lobby them. They just know that this is the closest level of government to them that they can influence. And so governors have found themselves, and this is a huge problem, where they're delivering one of the big, the easiest ones to explain is bursaries, education bursaries for students to go to primary school, to go to high school, uh, because they're associated fees with that, but mainly for university and technical colleges. But this is not a devolved function. Um, and so there's no way that this is, it's in their budget, they're doing it, but there's no, they don't have the ability because county governments are only responsible for early childhood education. Um, but if you want to get reelected, you're going to have to deliver bursaries to people. Um, and so county governments are spending even the little resources that they have on functions that are not theirs. Um, and things, for example, one of the ones that has suffered the most is training of doctors, where counties are supposed to train them. It was a devolved function, but we're not training, especially. It's almost impossible for doctors to get funding to be able to go to school and specialize because it's not a priority. They want doctors who are working. They don't want doctors who are away because they can barely afford to employ them. And people feel like even though you want a nurse, you want a school even more. Um, and this has become a huge issue. I think people do not realize that devolution is primarily about service delivery. People want it to be about development. Um, it's, it's This is slowly changing, um, especially the work of civil society, the fact that people are seeing governments, um, county governments move away from service delivery. There's a bigger push to focus on services. But still, when you're coming up to an election, governors need to show what they've built. Nobody's going to remember that I've been paying salaries and nurses have been coming to work or, um, you know, Agricultural extension officers are showing up in the counties. People want to see, they want roads, for example, you know, which national government is not really willing to send a lot of money down for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now I have so many questions <laughs> because we could go in so many different, different directions. directions. <laughs> One question that is is of interest to me would definitely be, um, you know, from almost a, a, a federal perspective, really this devolved power. Did that lead to a competition between counties for who can better deal with the problem or can raise maybe more revenue? Or was it on the other side more to provide more resources? So were the solutions, you know, um, tried to be found at the at the county level or was it just increasing pressure like at the at the center that's a good question because that was an aspirational value that you'd have inter-county competition and um, the commission of revenue allocation has actually tried to introduce that by creating in the revenue sharing sorry measure um are an index for revenue collection. So counties that collect more revenue, obviously it's called better indexes when the revenue is calculated and so they get a reward for that, which has also been very controversial because certain counties are always going to collect more revenue and I think they've changed that in the current formula. So the idea was that there was going to be this great competition. And remember, Kenya is quasi-federal. We don't operate the same way that the US government does. Um, they're not completely independent um, state, you know, local governments. But what interestingly happened is that, no, there was not competition. There are governors who do really well, and that's really nice for their counties, but it hasn't led to regional counties feeling pressure or national government feeling that uh, it should, you know, maybe step up. What has then happened with those counties, the people who have responded to counties that have done well have been development partners who have put in more money. Um, so like development... To, Go on. Sorry, development partners are um, partners of like NGOs, international development yes, funding yes. or yes. Yeah, international development agencies. Sorry, we call them partners. So a lot of IDAs, even some obviously many, many local civil society organizations in Kenya are funded by international um, development agencies or international organizations overseas. Um, they're the big ones, you know, uh, USA, Danida, um, UK Aid, which is now FCDO. So they're, they're World Bank. They have big projects in the counties. And even though they, try, they do try to spread out um, 
activities across all the different counties and they work with them and they have a, you know, a collaboration framework, you do find that counties that are doing better, that are moving activities faster, become the golden child. It has better results. You can, you know, do better reports. And so their projects move faster. They get more pilot projects, if you will, because then you can use that pilot project to ask for money. So I like to call those the golden children of devolution. Um, and mm-hmm. they, <laughs> and a lot of those, there's one particular county, and I think anyone listening to this podcast will know, he was very much, um, he was he worked in civil society before, was a great activist, had worked with development partners, and that probably explains. But he, he has done well, obviously, especially around the issue of public participation, interestingly enough, kind of the golden child. But um, that has now led, I don't think it's necessarily competition between counties, but doing well in your county, I think the first set of governors is hoping will propel them to the presidency. Um, the only challenge has been that because there's no inter county competition, even if your provin- even if your governor has not done well, there's still no need to elect somebody from another tribe to become the president because at the end of the day, there's still a lot of power left in the central government and people still want the presidency. Um, and if your governor is not going ahead trying to find the presidency or is not that kind of person, there's another candidate who is not a governor who is running for president. I would say further down the line, this may happen when we have counties that have done extremely well, uh, that everybody can see. And you have, the biggest thing is you have people moving into those counties who haven't lived there to be able to benefit from the services. We might begin to see that. But what we do see now is counties realizing that there are certain services that they cannot deliver on their own. There are certain economic benefits that they cannot seek on their own. And so we've had a bill that has been before the Senate several times um, to create, um, uh, what do they call them? Um, regional blocks um, where, you know, and the interesting, the regional blocks are structured around the eight former provinces where counties in the eight provinces have, so within the eight provinces, you have different counties that were created. So those former provinces have then come together to create a regional block to try and create an economic blueprint for the region, um, you know, to try and see what services they can deliver or how they can pool their resources to be able to better do development for the region. So that seems to have taken off more um, than this sense of, oh, you know, this county is doing so well, why aren't we putting pressure on our governor, holding him more accountable to ensure that, you know, we have the same kind of development. Um, and also the fact that I think those counties are still too spaced out. You know, the counties, Kelly is not a very big county, but one county to another is quite far. It's very hard to know what's going on in another county because even the reporting for local people is still... It's not that well documented. And so they wouldn't know. You know, you may hear things in the pipeline, but you're not really sure of what's going on in other counties. So be able to put that pressure on your governor is not something that has really gained traction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one question that I often think about, and I I don't really have uh, a clear answer yet, uh, but did the, the international or development partners, did they kind of take away from the accountability mechanisms at the county government level? Like, is there a way of, like, you know, if there were no development partners, let's put it like this, the the, the county governments would have to provide or t- maybe take more responsibility. Would you agree with that or not? Or no. maybe it's complicated. I mean, it's <laughs> it a is. huge issue, right? Yeah, it is. Um, it, it is. I, I think they've taken away from accountability in that it's hard for local communities to take their own responsibility for ensuring accountability. But at the same time, there's a concern. It's it's almost like you've gone too far down the track to be able to reverse it. And nobody has found a logical way or a sustainable way of creating locally funded community action. That's probably a better way to put it. Um, and so there is obviously county assemblies that have, you know, responsibility to do oversight of a county government, and they're not county councils. They are actual legislatures, they're parliaments, if you will, um, and they make legislation on matters concerning county governments. They, you know, they obviously the budget of the county government, uh, and they do oversight on county spending. They vet. Um, members of the executive nominated by the local government. And so they do have significant power, if you will. Um, but they also rely and they should do, and their intentions are they would rely on a very strong local active citizenry at the local level. Um, and 
obviously this has always been a problem in Kenya. I think it worked when people were advocating for um, democracy, when they're advocating for more um, multi-party system. And that was, it was easier. The issues around that were easier. When you look at county governments, the kind of legislation, for example, you need to pass, or the kind of accountability, the issues are slightly more technical for people. When you want to engage on the county budget, for example, the issues are very, very technical. They need to align with what is called the County Integrated Development Plan. What has the governor set as the annual development plan? You need to see if there's actually things that are going to benefit your county. What's the long run? Is this budget balance? Um, were there projects that had been budgeted for that have not been delivered that are being budgeted for again and those and I, I say this with great respect Kenya is still not a country where people are educated primary education is quite widespread um, but the level of higher education the ability for people to engage in some of those issues is still quite limited and so development partners have been active in supporting community-based organizations local development organizations um, to be able to support, if you will, create sort of facilitators, create champions on budgets, both to train the local community, get the community to come together and engage. But then you need to realize that as they do this, the community becomes reliant on somebody else driving the accountability process. Um, they have somebody who is going to distill the information for them, who is probably being paid by somebody in Nairobi, um, who is giving the fans for him to both spend time analyzing this information, is able to hire a consultant to be able to break down the budget and write a citizen's budget, if you will, for citizens in a way that they'll understand, is able to pay people sometimes in certain cases, not everybody, to attend these meetings. Even if they don't pay them, they provide lunch, they provide teas, they provide transport. You know, it's it's a whole system. Um, and when they provide lunch and teas, it makes it worthwhile for somebody to spend their day there rather than looking for something to earn money. Um, or they don't have to spend time reading the budget because it's going to be distilled for them. Um, or they're going to be told what to go and say when they go before the budget committee in the county assembly. So when you pull out, and this is what I talk about in my thesis, the concern is development actors have now almost written themselves into a fixed job. Because if you leave... How are these local communities going to fund these activities? Um, you're working on the fact that you're going to create strong local development organizations, but you're going to create them on the premise that they're not funding themselves from the beginning. You're funding them, and then you want to pull out, and you want them to fund themselves. Um, can it work? It's questionable, because the, the, the pulling out of development partners in different sectors, even at the national level, the issues of governance, the slowdown in funding has led to a very weakened civil society in Kenya. Uh, civil society, of course, many people did go into government, but still, there's, Kenya civil society has become very weak at the national level with a huge focus now being um, county government. So what happens when you know, donors are tired of county governments and there's another sexy issue on the table? It's a big problem. And I, I think, um, the, for, if you ask me, it's about building the culture of accountability and funding accountability must come from people themselves. How you do this is a big question, but that is a question that we need to contend with, not creating, and you're creating the problem at the national level at the county level. You need to create a culture of self-funding for accountability that's driven by Kenyans, driven by big corporates, driven by private sector who are really invested in this, um, but allowing them to fund as part of um, corporate responsibility, social accountability, and not to be able to drive their own agenda at the county, because that's the other thing. We don't have strong enough laws to, we haven't had a strong culture of lobbyists, but it can easily evolve there at the county level because they're not enough safeguards. And so you need to help them or create legislation as well as build a culture from the beginning where they support this for the sake of developing greater transparency and accountability and good governance within the county rather than driving it because you don't want the county assembly to pass this legislation or because you're hoping that your based company is going to be given this road when the governor is doing it, um, which is still a problem. So there are certain things in counties like conditional grants, which even development partners know, they fund those. There are still questions about who does the oversight on that. Is it national government? Is it national parliament? Um, or is it county assemblies? But in terms of engagement, um, it's, it's a difficult question, honestly, because right now a significant uh, percentage of the engagement that takes place, um, especially around the budget, which is we have a, a budget cycle that has different parts to it. A significant number of donors are putting money in that. And obviously it's early years. It's only been about 12 years. But still, the problem for me is that all of us are all these early years, we need to support it. But the problem is you're building in a certain culture 
that you know once you leave um there's no way for local actors to be able to continue the high standards that you have set um and I think it needs to be accompanied by several things which you know donors are no longer willing to fund. It needs to be accompanied by training local communities, giving scholarships to people and making sure that they come back into those communities, um, you know, engaging younger generations to fully understand and appreciate their responsibility for participation rather than just supporting actors who are already on the table, preventing gatekeeping. Um, and that, that is a huge undertaking, especially in a world where more and more international development partners have to show results to be able to justify their funding. And some of those results are 10, 15 years down the line and cannot be seen immediately. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are like certain dependencies, right, on on development partners between government and development partners. And also probably almost need to think about kind of... A, I don't know, a phasing out to move more responsibilities um, into the the governments. But that's a, a whole other discussion, I guess. I want to go back to the county governments and the county assemblies, also closer to uh, the, the research you've done. So one aspect that I always like to, to talk about is, you know, the electoral system in the county assemblies and also the, the governor, right? So... These are single member districts, single seat districts, and these electoral systems, like a plurality system, favors the bigger party um, or the bigger parties in you know in the community. Do you see like a kind of um, huge influence from, or or not huge, but an influence from the nationalized parties onto the the assemblies? Are the assemblies like? controlled usually by by one or the other party um that's a really good question um so obviously yes as you say there's single member not quite wards we call the ward district um in at the county assembly and in certain places so you have again this comes down to ethnic politics in kenya so nairobi county assembly for example is very multicultural because nairobi is a capital city um and you know you there are people from all over kenya who live here and so it is the biggest county assembly and it has 85 elected members and 38 nominated i, I don't have an exact breakdown of the tribal representation, but that will also usually reflect how people of different tribes live in the city. So ward members who come from a certain area where, let's say a constituency, um, where people live, you'll have a lot of ward members being of that tribe. And generally, members of a similar tribe will be in a similar party. Yeah. Um, and so Lamu, for example, which has, Lamu is a different, Lamu is the smallest county assembly, if not mistaken, it has 15 MCAs. It's very tiny compared to this Nairobi, which you can see has 100 and something. Um, it has, Lamu has a distinction of, you have Kikuyus who are from central Kenya, who settled in Lamu, and then you have indigenous um, Swahilis, if you will, who live in Lamu. And so they have a divided county assembly because they have clashes between the Kikuyus and the um, the or their Swahilis, and they're in different political parties because they have different political interests. Mombasa, which has, I think, 50, I'm not sure, let me not give a number. It has about, in the range between 40 to 50 something members of its county assembly, is a multicultural um, city as well. It's the second largest city in Kenya, but it is predominantly, because of history, um, it has always sided with. Um, Ray Laudinga, they've always voted for Ray Laudinga, who is a Luo. They share similar political values. They have had serious issues with land. And so even though people are from different tribes there, at one point, I think in the last election, I'm not sure if it's the same in, in the 2010 election, 12 election, it was all, if I'm not mistaken, that entire assembly was full of one political party. I think in the current assembly that's going to end, um, there may be one or two people who are from a different political party, but the majority are, even though they're from different tribes, you know that if you don't run in ODM, you are not finding your way into the assembly. And so everybody joins that particular um, political party. But then you have areas like northeastern Kenya who practice a very different sort of politics. They practice negotiated democracy where they make decisions by clans. And so the clans agree um, who is being elected. Yeah. And sometimes 
the clans may agree with a person who is in a different political party, but the person they're electing a person, they're not electing a political party. They will generally have, um, they'll generally all be in one political party. Recently, we are seeing an, an emergence of based on devolution, communities creating their own political parties so that they can have their own negotiating power. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the assembly. So they have their own local community, their own political party for their local elections, but they're going to be part of a major coalition that only delivers the presidency. Um, and so it plays out. Kenyan politics is very much about tribe. And so some of these political parties that exist in this election will not exist in the next one uh, because they'll have been done away with. So Political parties are a vehicle to power, and when they're no longer useful or they no longer have the ability to be able to deliver people to the presidency, they're done away with, and they create new vehicles that are that are reflective of how the politics at the national level is being arranged. But I, I would answer your question and say, largely, you do see that people from, especially in the rural areas, political parties um, will tend to be, I mean, members of their ward from the wards will tend to be from one political party, um, especially in very far, like in really rural areas, because all the ward members will have stood under one party to get the support of people voting for the president who came from that region. Um, and so the assembly will be very much from one tribe and from one you know, will be ODM or will be Jubilee. But you need to remember that even though they then get there on one political party, at the county level, they're very deep clan issues. <laughs> we never stop. So we have ethnic policy when you get into clan issues. So sometimes holding the governor to account, you'll have that everybody's a non-political party, but they impeach the governor or they impeach the speaker because they then have Inter-clan issues where a certain clan is not happy with the governor or feels that the governor is only awarding tenders to members of his clan. And so just because members of your political party are in power doesn't mean that as a speaker or a governor or a committee chair um, that you will get everything that you want. The clan issues play a big part when it comes to local development, which has had its own intricacies on development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thanks for, for sharing all these thoughts and analysis. Last but not least, I'd like to talk a bit about your your thesis and um, how uh, at the local level people can participate in political decision making. And It's, I think it's very important, you know, uh, participation of the, of the local population in, 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 in decision making. So the, my question is, or two questions probably. Um, one is, what are the instruments for people really to participate uh, at, at the county level? And the other one would be, what is uh, from your research, from your um, experience also, what are the results and do actually people get a say or is it more a bit pro forma like is is has it influence on on county politics um to answer your first question um it's not necessarily instruments so we have public participation required by law on almost every decision taken by government whether it is appointing a board um or in the case of counties, development of their development plans, on their budgets, um, when they're determining spending priorities, on committee meetings. So committee meetings are open and anybody can attend. And really, um, the committee can, can invite public participation on legislation, but people are free to attend. And if you really had something to say, I don't think any chair would try to stop you, both at the national level and the county level, probably more at the county level because of how that can impact their politics. But Participation is required on every single legislation. Um, the problem that we have is that we have never had um, a structured, we don't have a leg public legislation law, if you will, public, public participation legislation. So there's no definitive structure or minimums that you have to meet in order to be able to um, say that you've conducted public participation, if you will, or certain things that are similar across the board and it's left very much the discretion of respective institutions. There are guidelines that have been given, for example, by the Ministry of Devolution um, on public participation, but there's been attempts to pass legislation at the national parliament that has failed um, several times. There are several bills that are um, across in both houses that have never gone forward. Um, And so public participation has really turned into a public hearing. And 
this then goes on to your second question of this then is a frustration because we created public participation but the problem is that actually when you read the provisions for public participation, when you read the kind of trading materials that are out there and what is expected, what they're providing for is deliberation. Um, and what you then have is that public participation is a language that people know. And this, is again, is because of development practitioners. So development practitioners use the language of participation because that is easily understood by everybody, but created an expectation, especially among the public, of deliberation. They want to have a discussion. They want to see how you know their input is considered by committees, is considered by the executive. They want explanations for why government has deviated from what they've said, but that is not happening. One, because of resources, um, it's, this is, deliberation is extremely expensive to do. Two, facilitating this on every single legislation is practically impossible. And three, the politics of decision making is more complex than you know simply what's put out there. And that is so managing expectations at the outset is not done. And people have this idea that they can just change anything based on what they want. Um, and politicians feel that we have given you an opportunity to engage, but they're not expecting deliberation. And so they're frustrated either because people are engaging on the wrong issues or because they feel that public expectation is too high for what they can practically engage in. And what really, without clear a clear legislation that you know demands specific things, they don't have to deliver on. They don't have to do. They've given you a chance to say, we we'll listen to you, we'll list, they'll always attach a public participation you know, memorandum at the back and who attended and what they said. They are required to say why they didn't take certain decisions, but nobody takes them to court. There's never been any ruling that really they should um, de deliberate and show how they arrived at certain decisions, even though certain legislation do provide for that. Um, the court has ruled that public information, that what it has ruled on is that there should be widespread because what they would do is they publish in the newspaper a call for public participation on this legislation. So particularly in county governments, there's been demands for using other news that people can actually access because very few people can access a newspaper. So using radios, using town halls, you know, announcing. And so you find that more and more they do that because failing to do participation will definitely lead to going to court and that legislation has been struck out. So that is clear for everybody. But whether the participation is actually doing what it's supposed to, I believe is about mismatched expectation to start with. It is very performative, but really the, what donors have sold, because um, I think even in the global north, uh, deliberation is expensive. You see the attempts to institutionalize things like citizens' assemblies, deliberative polls. They're mainly done by external actors. Um, very few, very rich countries in the global north have been able to institutionalize like Belgium and create kind of these permanent citizens' assemblies. People in the global south are struggling to just have the opportunity to participate. Governments barely have enough human resources, to, human resource power to be able to run the actual business of the legislature, trying to then introduce another layer of deliberation is simply not going to happen, not in the way the current research on uh, deliberation is proceeding with the kind of gaze and lens on the Global North and Global North institutions and structures. Um, there needs to be a greater push to understanding as well um, the kind of history of political engagement in the Global South. Um, and like in Kenya, you have to consider um, our post-colonial history, uh, the fact that you know, engagement with government has a lot of ties with how government was set up, how people view government, how people don't view government as genuine, that they don't, they view government as an extractive space for their communities. And so participation is more something that you do, but it's not where you go when you really want something for your community. When you want something, you go speak to the governor, you speak to your MP, you organize a local meeting for your ward representative and tell him to come home you know, to the village and meet the local elders where decisions are then made about what he's going to do in the legislature. And so public participation in a formal sense remains um, a space for lobbyists, for development partners, for people who have jobs and need to respond to it. Um, and without clear legislation that actually clarifies what it is that we're trying to do and creating legislation that are actually friendly and creating um, a facilitative mechanism putting the resources for a facilitated mechanism for deliberation where counties spend. And I had somebody say recently at the OECD report, a kind of independent, almost like an ombudsman, a kind of independent office within the legislature that facilitates public participation, provides the facilitators, helps them engage. 
then maybe we'll begin to feel that people trust government, that it's not just the legislature or the executive that is doing this, but there are external actors that are facilitating making this information available, distilling decisions and, you know, translating them. But there, it's, it's a very complex issue. Um, and that's what my research showed, you know. People don't want it to go away, but the fear is more a regression of democracy. Not that they want more opportunities to participate. They like it just fine how it is, but it's more because they feel that if it was to be done away with because it's not efficient, we will return to an era where people don't have a say in government, where you know we begin to regress in democracy and it will translate the national level and devolution will go away. Um, so it gives people an assurance. But if you're studying its effect, it's mainly just performative, really. Um, there's mismatched expectations, you know, different understandings of what's going on um, and the resource constraints are one of the biggest issues that nobody is addressing. To have effective participation, you really do need to put in a lot of money. And in counties and countries where basic services are already a problem, um, this this obviously, I know it's some say corruption, but even if you take into account corruption, which so that doesn't exist in the global north, delivering services, you know, when you're comparing creating, you know, delivering water to people or hiring nurses or building a hospital to setting up an entire department to just facilitate public participation and translate documents into different tribes You have, and, you know, taking money out of the budget just for that, it's likely to become, um, you know, a very contentious issue and could actually even cost somebody an election. Yeah. Wow, super interesting. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for sharing these developments. And also my personal opinion actually on this topic is, you know, participation is, is great and it's important, but I think uh, for me, priority is always on representation in the official assemblies, you know. So the better representation in the assemblies, in the actual assemblies, the more power is uh, also um, shared among different groups in society. So my last question is, uh, if people want to read up on some of these uh, topics, do you have any books or papers that you could recommend? And of course, I can link to to your to your research also uh, in the show notes. Yeah, I mean, I may have to send you some sure. of this. I mean, I think one of the books that would give people um, the most uh, comprehensive, or rather a snapshot, if you ask me, because there are many books written on Kenyan politics, but the Routledge Handbook of Kenyan Politics does a good job of combining, um, what do you call it, a quick snapshot of Kenyan's history, starting from, you know, the um, advocacy for a new constitution, and then kind of how that has changed different aspects of Kenyan society and Kenya's politics. So I, I really like that for just a beginner reader. Um, and then, of course, there are numerous other books that detail different parts of Kenya's history. I think a lot of it currently is still being written. I know there's a book, I can't remember the names, but um, authors such as Mutaha Kangu, who is publishing a book on Kenya's revolution. Um, there's Professor Karuchi Kanyinga, who has written numerous papers um, on Kenya's revolution and was a big part of the arbitration that led to the 2010 constitution especially the 2007 um, eight election balance. Um, so I would definitely talk about those too. And I could send you some to link to the blog um, if people want more specific books. But I would say for an early reader, the most recent book that I've seen that covers a good um, space, a good chunk of time written by different authors is definitely the Handbook on Kenyan Politics, um, which has, and most of the authors there, people like Nick Cheeseman, who has done a lot of work um, on Kenya's devolution, and governors and oversight and you know elections definitely have an act they have a chapter there but also their work um is definitely something that somebody would want to read mm -hmm. cool yeah definitely um link to those in in the show notes so brenda thanks a lot um for taking the time to uh, be a guest on on the rules of the game podcast it has been fascinating very interesting i've i've learned a lot and uh, i think Kenya is definitely a very important and interesting example of how the evolution can happen and what are kind of the issues uh, around it. So thanks a lot, Brenda. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for inviting me. And it was great to talk about Kenya. And it's not all doom. I think Kenyans are very happy with devolution. I must say that. And I think they would still choose this form of government, regional government and decision making of a centralized government. So I think it's acknowledging that, you know, development and change is incremental. Um, and, you know, it's one step at a time. And we've achieved certain things in this generation and the next generation will achieve other things.
Mm-hmm. Cool. Yes. That's that's good to hear. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.